Okay, we are live. What's up, everybody okay. out there? Welcome to another episode of Police Off the Cuff After Hours. My name is Mark DeMeo. I'm your host. I'm here with my uh, my partner, my co-host in all things law enforcement, the very handsome Bill Cannon. What's up, Bill? Excited about tonight, all the way from the Netherlands, and you can tell all our audience all about her. Yeah, she stuck it out, man. It's like one o'clock in the morning over there, right? <laughs> it is. <laughs> she, she set her alarm clock to get up for this show. <laughs> So uh, without further ado, our guest tonight is uh, a self-published author of true crime uh, books She's uh, that are uh, on serial killers, Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy, Richard Ramirez, Ed Kemper, all of them, you name it. She's a former air airline pilot. She has her own podcast, and uh, she did a great job promoting the show, man. I wish I had your enthusiasm. Gisela <laughs> Kirsten, what's up, Gisela? That's it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, good thing we didn't have to fly you in. It would have cost us a fortune. <laughs> you know? I don't know if we could afford you. <laughs> we yeah. probably couldn't afford you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you could. I can go to New York any day. <laughs> that would have taken our annual budget right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've done a lot. I mean, I only I only scratched the surface here on um, all the things that you've done. You get fired a lot, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> how many jobs have you gotten fired from? You, how do you get fired? I'm kidding. <laughs> you never were fired. But get, take so through this, this <laughs> list of all, the, all these things that you've done. Besides yeah. for the airline pilot, there was other stuff too there, right? There's other stuff there. Don't know where you guys find it. It's not on LinkedIn. There's a lot of things I did there. Um, I was in the drone industry for a bit. All kinds of stuff. After I flew, I just wanted to try everything. <laughs> how did you do so that? I tried a lot of things. You were a commercial pilot? Yeah, I was an airline pilot at South African Airways um, for nine years. How was that? Then, How did you like that? It was okay. It's very male-dominated industry, and you sit around in a metal tube for very many hours. <laughs> and I'm very hyperactive, so. <laughs> but that wasn't a good fit for you then, being an not really. Pilot. No, I was really no. like really a busybody, you know. So I would always want to like do everything in the flight deck. Like, don't worry, the captain can sleep. I'll do it all because I was just like so much energy. Wow. So it's kind of like. A bit torturous, <laughs> you know, because I'm now, so. Did you, did you grow up in South Africa? I grew up in South Africa, yeah. I only moved here two years ago. Yeah, because you have that really cool South African accent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you. Uh, when you listen yeah. to us, you're probably like, that's that lazy New York accent. <laughs> Just wait for you to say the coffee. <laughs> coffee, coffee, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Hey, uh, yeah. Yeah, I just want you from South Africa. Huh? I just want to say uh, thank you for uh, dumping that. Uh, what's his name? Noah on us. Oh yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> what's his name? Oh, Noah? Oscar. Are you talking what? about Oscar? Or there's so many of them. No, the talk show host. <laughs> oh. What's the guy, name? On, the guy on CNN? You mean? Oh, Trevor Noah. Yeah. Trevor Noah. Yeah. Noah, Trevor Noah. Yeah. yeah. Trevor yeah. Noah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot for yeah. that one. <laughs> we owe you. We got to send you like five horrible comics over there now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just so yeah. one of the things that I found interesting, you're big into like psych the psychology of crime and also self-care and taking care of you. And you said yeah. you admitted on one of your, not that it's a big confession, but you admitted <laughs> on one of your podcasts that you're not a psychologist, but you're a mental patient. Yep. I say that. Otherwise, Tell us, tell us about that. I should tell you about being a mental patient. Yeah, um, yeah of course. Yeah, so I've seen on some of the podcasts, you also talk about PTSD, so I can relate on that. Um, I grew up in a pretty tough environment, and yeah, so I would understand trauma. That That's why I like the psychology aspect of the development of criminals, I guess. Um, I understand that you get to a crossroad, you know, what, you, what are you going to choose in life? You know, what are you going to choose to do with your life? And how will you channel this trauma? And so for me, I sought therapy because I think that's the right thing to do you know so I've been in therapy for three years now and yeah so I could talk a lot about all that stuff I can definitely no, no, relate I, th I, th I think that's good and it's fascinating and it also yeah. opens up the world of what you've chosen to go into writing about mm -hmm. serial killers you know yeah. but it seems like everyone today has you know their bipolar tripolar quadpolar yeah. syncopolar see it whatever I can't even count to 10 in Spanish but Everyone's got some kind of polar <laughs> disease. 
you know. <laughs> it's true, uh, yeah. So labels are kind of they put you in a box, and I, I mean, I do like boxes, but it's not good to just <laughs> run with a label. You know, you're still a human being, and you 100%, decide. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I like it. Yeah. She said she's, she likes boxes. Women yeah. like boxes, like storing stuff. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, the really good stuff. You want. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to catch um, rest. <laughs> how did you get involved with the with the writing about it? I mean, obviously, you had a fascination with serial killers, right? Well, with crime in general, my dad was a cop, my biological dad, who I saw on school holidays when I was between the age of five and 11, because him and my mother had split up since I was like two. Um, so he was a cop, and I was always so excited to go with him because he didn't really take leave when I went to visit, so I would have to kind of do the stakeouts and the things with him in the car, and the car chases, And but then I wasn't allowed in the crime scene, of course, <laughs> It was just me in the car, and I always wondered what's on the other side. Like, uh -huh. what happened there? So the fascination already grew there, you know. To like, I would like to know <laughs> what happens in the apartments or in the crime scenes, and so that's pretty much where it started. I would say. Yeah, you know what's? I'll give you a. Um, I hate to burst your bubble, you know, but the truth <laughs> is, you go inside, you take a peek in the crime scene, and if you're lucky, it doesn't smell. 99% of the time, the body, the corpse that's there has been there for a while. It smells, and you can't wait You can't wait to get out. I can imagine. It's uh, <coughs> the first thing. Sometimes you walk in, you know, sometimes the, the, the body's been there for a while, and that's how you find yeah. out because the neighbors start smelling it. So just imagine. The first thing you say is uh, find the coffee. So you start going through the all the cabinets to see if you can find coffee grinds so you can put them on the stove and start uh, yeah. get the, knock that smell out of there a little bit. But mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of times I wish I was uh, standing on the other side of that crime scene tape, just wondering because, yeah. and, and you know, it's gory too. You know, you have to start thinking about what happened here and that changes your mindset. Bill has been on a ton of homicide scenes. Yeah. Well, you know, th wh that's one of the, um, you know, I was never an expert at crime scenes, you know, like reading blood spatter. And actually, mm -hmm. I always admired crime scene detectives that could tell you exactly what happened from reading the crime scene. Yeah. And I got better at it, but I was never anywhere near as good as they were, you know. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> oh, this is where the lady was hit and she dragged her over, you know, just by <laughs> looking at the blood spatter, you know. Yeah. Damn. That's fascinating work, definitely. Yes. Yep. <coughs> Excuse me. What do you got? A cold? Yeah, I have a little bit. I have a little bit of allergies. I think. Yeah, the know. allergies are bad right now. Yeah. You know who's not <laughs> suffering from the allergies that bad right now? Who? Me. You know why? Why? Because I do the cold showers. That's why. Yeah, I don't bite it. <laughs> yeah. I do the, I I do the cold it. showers. It helps your immune system. Yeah, the, the Vim. The That's Vim what they say. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten uh, even my arthritis is not acting up this year. Damn. <laughs> you know, I, I was I was reading some of this before mm -hmm. listening to one of your podcasts about him, and what what a despicable, despicable serial killer John Wayne Gacy was. Yep. You know, true. and he was one of the people that you were obviously very interested in. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little about him. About John Wayne Gacy? Yeah. Well, why I was interested? Yeah. John Wayne Gacy, he was a chancer. He really was. Like, he was so arrogant and just took chances every way he could. And I don't know, just the audacity of him just really got me, like, what he did. And to think that he actually kind of built his crime scene into his house, that he could actually sleep like that above all of those bodies and just do it again and again was just so shocking to me. Like, <laughs> how did he do that? And he was married before he had kids in the house and it's just that just got me and when i wrote the book i felt like honestly i was stuck in the crawl space for a long time like needed to come out you know on the other side it feels like that when you're writing these really intense books and studying these cases like you kind of get stuck in those places <laughs> yeah it's like you need to take a shower after you deal with someone yeah. like him right <laughs> for a few weeks yeah <laughs> yeah just well, like with a mock take a cold shower <laughs> yeah you know you mentioned we, uh, we we started off the conversation with talking about mental illness and being a, a mental patient yeah and you know it's curious to me that like you said you, you're in therapy but you're also really delving much much deeper than the average person does in the psychology of somebody who's really not right Mm -hmm. And you, like you mentioned, you spend a lot of time there, and you also just mentioned that it takes you time to get out. 
Um, yep. Do you think that's healthy? <laughs> Well, I mean, therapy. So, I mean, I talk to therapists about it and they help me you, you, get out of those spaces. So I don't know. I don't think it's ultimately like healthy, but it's the best thing I can do based on all the trauma that I've been through to channel that correctly. That's what I would say. I think, I think it might be healthy, actually, because I think you're, yeah. um, you're not scared to, to, um, to continue to, to learn, to, uh, to go to areas that might frighten you. Yeah. So I, I think that's actually healthy, you know, because you also forget about how crazy you are. You're like, look at how yeah. fucking crazy. <laughs> this guy's a nut. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I cursed. Uh, uh, look at how look at how crazy this person is. I'm okay, you know. Yep. Well, but it's kind of like that, and also just understanding abusers because that's what I've tried to do my whole life. One of my coping mechanisms in childhood was to develop empathy. So there's that whole debate, are you born with empathy or do you develop it? But like I developed it to understand the abusers in my life. And so I try to understand people like Gacy and all these people I write about, like, why would you do this? <laughs> and a lot of them are reliving their own trauma by doing these horrendous things. So if they could just realize that <laughs> and go to therapy, they might not do that. But, you know, yeah. one of the things about um, serial killers, they exhibit a lot of the same traits early yeah. on, like yeah. the killing of animals, the torturing mm -hmm. of animals. Yeah. Uh, some of those traits are just synonymous with mm -hmm. someone who's going to become a serial killer. Yep. True. Which is so I don't, know, I don't know if therapy necessarily would help them, you know. Maybe not. It's just self-awareness. I think some of them, as you can see, even when they're on death row, they're so in denial about what they've done. Someone said, one of the psychologists said, if Gacy could have accepted what he did, he would have killed himself. Like, it's just too much to bear to really have that self-awareness and accept what you are and what you've done. You know, so it's kind of like I just promote self-awareness more than obviously they could be born really psychopathic and hurt animals and do the whole fire setting and <laughs> bed wedding and all those signs but yes yeah you still got to decide you know what you're going to do tell us uh, a little bit about the research that go gets involved like how how long does it how much research do you do before you actually put pen to paper well you know you start typing it's Probably at least two months of pure research um, before I even start writing anything. I usually do the structure of the book first because, you know, I like boxes. As you said, women like boxes. So I make the structure of my book and then I'm like, okay, now I'm going to watch every movie, every documentary, read everything I can about this person and really like absorb them to really understand before I start writing. So I'm very like immersive. <laughs> I'm sure you'll gather. So for me, it's like seven days a week. So even if I say two months, it might sound kind of short, but it's like all day, every day, it's on my mind at all times. So I'm like immersive in the case, yeah. Before I start writing, so. Which uh, one is which one? Um, because uh, you uh, do you write? Uh, each book is about a, a separate serial killer, or yeah. is it like okay? So, wh which so have, uh, Bill brought up uh, Gacy, but which one like really took the most out of you? The like disturbed you the most? Ted Bundy, honestly. <laughs> I don't even understand exactly why it was so triggering for me, but it was terrible to write that book. Like he, his whole case and <laughs> about it was just horrendous. It just some days I would just be typing and literally tears would be streaming down my face. And I didn't exactly understand why this is hitting me so hard, but it was just a horrible case. I think it's because he also preyed on people's empathy. You know, he did the whole arm sling thing and pretended to be really injured and, and then when women were kind to him, he rewarded that with the most gruesome stuff. So that really got to me because I'm a pretty kind person. I would help that person. <laughs> yeah, you know what's interesting okay. about Ted, Ted Bundy, too, is that he maintained the relationship. He might have taken a break from yeah. uh, killing while he, was, uh, while he had that relationship. I watched the whole uh, series yeah. on Netflix. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. uh, I, you know, I know as much as it told me, but he, he was... Um, Somehow he managed to maintain a relationship. He managed to care for uh, yep. his uh, his companion's child. Exactly. Um, well. And kind of sort of, you know, be like a surrogate dad for her while he was there and did a fine job of it. Mm -hmm. Sort of. He was also abusive, though. She's come out with that now to say that he sexually abused her. Oh, really? <laughs> so he wasn't such. You see, that's the image he likes to put out. He liked to put out there what a what an awesome dad and boyfriend and everything it was, but 
yeah, she came out with new information. You know, Gisela, Gisela, I was in um, <clears throat> homicide for 10 years in Manhattan North. So we were busy. I went to hundreds of murder scenes. Yeah. And I, I don't have the same like interest in serial killers that the public has. I see them yep. as really evil, you know, perps, basically, yep. criminals. Yep. But the public is so enamored with serial killers. And they're that. so <laughs> right. It's like a sexy thing oh, to no, be a no, serial no. killer. <laughs> yeah. You know, look how society looks at them. Like, oh, this guy did 39 murders. Oh, this guy mm -hmm. did 35. Oh, he's the most successful. Using the word successful with it doesn't have any word any you know, way to be in the same sentence as serial exactly. killer, you know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, you know, we could, we could very easily, uh, when the first one comes out, we could be falling into a pattern right now where instead of watching or reading about serial killers in the future, we're going to hear about mass shooters. We're going to mm -hmm. find out True. what their history was, and there's going to be a story with a, a heart, a bleeding yeah. heart in the middle of it and all the trauma they went through before they went to wherever they went and, un, you know, unleashed hell. So exactly. uh, it, I don't know why people are fascinated by this kind of stuff, you know? You know, Gisela, uh, just to let you know, we have a lot of your fans on here that are uh, shouting oh. out to you. The awesome. Right Shoe, How is the Haunting? Yes. Um, <laughs> How's Mr. the Haunting? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Smith, very interesting lady. Uh, you got a bunch of your fans. Um, Laura Daly. Who else we got here? I see a few of, uh, well, Dawn Marie's with us, I think. Uh, uh, Joe Murray <laughs> wanted to know if, a sexual predator, if a sexual predator could benefit from psychoanalysis, I think so. You think so? I really do. Yeah. You know, I used to work on the same floor as Manhattan Special Victims, mm -hmm. and I had, I was, I had a, a real good place in my heart for those detectives. They dealt with the most heinous crimes to investigate. Yeah, they were so good. <coughs> they were so good at it. Yep. That's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. <laughs> yeah. What are you working on now? So right now, um, my, my next book will be on Edmund Kemper. So is he the tall one? Good. Yeah, he's the tall one. And he was in alive. another show that I was watching on TV, on, on Netflix. They, they yep. cover a lot of stories there. And they yep. did an interesting job with him. What is he like, six eight or something, or six ten, right? Yeah, real, real and apparently a really high IQ as well, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, in the show, I, in the show I watched, he was helping them uh, trying to catch another serial yeah. killer <laughs> while he was in exactly. custody. Yeah, but tell us about him. So I haven't, I haven't actually started that yet. That's like I've just published um, Eileen Wernos, and so. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. Eileen Wernos. That's the monster, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the that's the movie was called Monster. Yeah. Yep. Wow. And she was a, a prostitute and she was killing her uh, Johns. Yep, she was. All in one year as well, which is kind of weird at that age. <laughs> you know, she was not killing anyone. And then suddenly in one year after kind of snapping, she just went on with that. So, yeah. I used to coordinate okay. the homicide course for the detective bureau in, in uh, the NYPD. And we used to bring uh, somebody from the FBI to talk about serial killers. And mm -hmm. the one that used to come the most often to speak, a uh, lecturer, was um, she used to talk about uh, the Green Mile Killer. Mm -hmm. And that was an interesting case. And how, yeah. um, you know, these a lot of these crimes that committed an opportunity. This this guy was uh, a, a truck driver, a semi, um, a rig, the 18-wheelers mm -hmm. going across country. So it just so happened that... When you look at it on a map now, you realize all the, the killings happen right next to truck stops. He'd yep. park his truck and <laughs> take a walk off into the woods, and wherever he came out, he'd knock on a door and kill, you know, if a lady answered, mm -hmm. he'd kill her. Yep. Gisela, uh, yeah. Scott Wagner wants to know if you're familiar with the Aaron Key case, who was known as the shopping cart killer. They uh, A&E did a special on him. Um, no, I'm actually not. I'd be very interested he to was He was killing... Uh, girls in the projects and raping in Sodom. He was also a serial sex offender. Mm -hmm. But okay. uh, it was it was sol it was the first case in, in New York State history that was solved through uh, DNA, through okay, DNA. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it was 1997. And that seems like it's not that long ago, but that was yeah. actually <laughs> the first hit in New York State history and probably maybe one of the first in the United States. 
Well, you know, now that you mention it, Bill, I mean, the United States seems to have uh, cornered the market on serial killers. Obviously, we have, um, you know, the um, was the Jack the Ripper from England. Uh, I guess I guess he's the one that sparked this, started it all off. But yeah. since then, I mean, I don't know of any serial killers that come from the Netherlands or South Africa, to tell you the one. truth. There was one, apparently. One. <laughs> Can't remember the name. When I looked it up, because, you know, I like looking up <laughs> what are the stats, what am I dealing with? I'm very, like, hypervigilant wherever I live, obviously coming from South Africa. But here there was, like, one. That I found. <laughs> one. I don't even really remember the name. I was just like, ah, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would move to New York because we have an app over here that can tell you um, where the crime is happening <laughs> Wow! in your area. <laughs> yeah. like, once Every once in a while, you'll get a, um, you know, an alert. The guy's outside your door right now. <laughs> Go yeah. hide in the closet. <laughs> Don't answer I'm the like, door. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds pretty awesome, though, to have that, because otherwise now I'm just wondering. I'm just walking around. I look at the police sites here, you know, what's happening in the area, but nothing happens here. Yeah. Honestly, it's a very yeah, safe yeah, country count, here. Count your blessings. Well, you, yeah. know, you know, another thing, um, Gisela, is that serial killers are very are quite rare now because mm -hmm. of technology, cell phones, video cameras, all the technology that catches other crimes yeah. also prevents, you know, cell phone technology is one of the biggest reasons uh, we would solve homicides at a much higher yeah. rate than ever yeah. before. And there's other technology that deals with electronic surveillance and with computers that people don't even know about that help yep. us to solve crimes now okay yeah well that's awesome the less yeah. the better yeah but i mean <laughs> you know so what the, in the real crime episodes how are people now oh my god there'll be no more serial killers what are we gonna do <laughs> yeah. well yeah, you nicer things yeah yes <laughs> yeah they just are you familiar with the gilgo beach cases mm, not really no um no, I wish I was familiar with all the cases, honestly, but I'm doing all these classic ones because I was, when I grew up, I wasn't really allowed to like read into these classic cases. <laughs> it was Is like off limits. Right now? Sorry? I mean, are you working off a list? Um, no, I'm just, I'm just being intuitive with whatever I want to write about next. So started no, with Dharma. I, I, maybe, maybe, I thought maybe you had a list and you're going to go through the list because I was wondering if uh, the son of Sam was on that list. That's yeah, another. It's, it's definitely. I do have like a plan for the next 10 books at least. It's just I don't know exactly in which order I'm going to do them. Well, there's yeah. a there's a Netflix special right now on the son of Sam. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of um, uh, retired NYPD detectives and officers that are that aren't fond of it because they're kind of like uh, hinting at maybe that, you know, that they, they rushed to an arrest and they didn't really investigate afterwards when there was a lot of. Uh, that, that's come out now, probably maybe maybe evidence that shows that he he wasn't working alone. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you know that also mm -hmm. you also have to say that once he was arrested, the murder stopped. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, what I'm saying? you know, Mark, people can make stuff up because it benefits <laughs> them. Really, I'm serious because uh -huh. I just got contacted by a TV station that wants to do this double murder case that I worked on in 2000 where an Asian girl and her black boyfriend murdered both of her parents and threw them in the East River. Now, the media at that time was going at the angle that, oh, it was like Romeo and Juliet. The parents didn't like him because he was black and she was Asian. And I said, no, that's not the reason they didn't like him. They didn't like him because he was a loser. And she was an honor student. And when she started going out with him, her grades fell and she almost flunked out of school. <laughs> but they wanted to go with that racist angle. And these mm -hmm. TV stations call me up and they're saying, oh, we heard it. I said, no, it's not that. All of a sudden you can hear the <laughs> air go out of their balloon. They might as yeah. well just hang up on you. <laughs> yeah, well, well, one station went with the angle anyway and just didn't use us. Because yeah, yeah. I told them that's not true. Uh -huh. So they, they did it anyway and they used the DA and they didn't tell him what angle they were going with. Mm -hmm. That's disgusting. It just shows yeah. you there's no... Even the New York Times printed that story, and it was all because of this. And I, we called the Times and said, where did you get that from? You just made that up. Uh -huh. and, and they did make it up because it wasn't true. Well, there is, like you said, there's this, uh, they want to fit a narrative. Even we had Eric Reynolds on our show. And Eric Reynolds is probably one of our most controversial guests because he was the first officer that responded to uh, what was happening in Central Park 
what was later to be known as the Central Park Five. Mm -hmm. And he told his side of the story. And there's people like, you know, flipping out because it doesn't match what they saw on TV. So what do you want to take it from? Well, that, that documentary that was so slanted. Well, yeah, that, that one, that one, there was two. There was uh, the way they see us or something like that. That one was told through the, the the eyes of a parent, and I'm I'm telling you, I'm a parent too. No matter what my kid does, he's, they're, they're angels. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So you believe that's what parents do. They believe in all the other kids. So that one I completely discarded. It was useless. But even the one that kind of sort of went half and half and tried to be, or you know, like a real news story, mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of problems with them too. But he tells his side <laughs> of the story. That's all he does. And for some reason, people can't. They can't let it go. It, they, they this constantly comments, you know, screw this guy, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. Wait a minute, you're talking about the arresting officer, the guy <laughs> that was actually there. He's African American. He's telling you what he witnessed. How how, <laughs> how do we continue to discard this guy? Because a narrative that <laughs> you want to fit this story into. Exactly. It happens, that happens a lot. A lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it happens a ton. Yep. Too much that. Uh, you know, it, it, there's either truth or there's a narrative, you know, and like we see that a lot in this country. Uh, Duty Ron is saying hi, Gisela. Duty Ron's okay. another podcaster. Sandra Melinda, hey, how's hey, it going? Uh, hey, uh, hi, Sandra <laughs> Melinda. Michelle, 6311. Duty Ron's in the house. Mr. Smith, how's it haunting? <laughs> Laura Daly, Peter Pranzo, and Richella Pranzo. The longest married couple on this uh, live stream, Joe Murray, the famous lawyer, Joe Murray, Ryan Investigative Group, MC I have a Zonio, feeling. Charleston Amy. Oh my God, look at all these people. Unbelievable. <laughs> I have Carol a feeling. That, Alaska. I have a feeling Trudy Astrology is one of your friends, Gisela. <laughs> I do not know Trudy Astrology, but hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she says hi. I yeah. I just feel it's one of yours. The right shoe is saying Gisela is such a great person. She really is truly. Awesome. The right shoe is a really great podcast too. Oh, the right shoe is a podcast? That's yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. I like that name, the right shoe. Yeah. I'm always trying to find my right shoe in the morning and I can't find <laughs> it, you know? <laughs> so what, what is your podcast about? So my podcast is pretty much a marketing tool for my books, to be honest. I just read some of the, the chapters out of my books and I talk about why I wrote the book and what's in the book and things like that. Um, so that's that. Sometimes I do some other standalone like series. I did a whole cannibal series and, you know, some other stories in between. But mostly I just I just kind of want to talk about the books, um, especially for people who can't or don't want to buy the books. It's just to also cover the case for them, you know? My girlfriend is, uh, she's a big fan of sh uh, true crime. Mm -hmm. And I, what I notice about, like, she's, she's solving like three c crimes at a time, by the way. She's got it <laughs> on the Kindle. There's one crime that she's solving. Then she's got her, <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's got the laptop. She's, and then there's one on the phone. <laughs> like this, she's solving them. But one thing I noticed is that a lot of stuff that she watches is basically somebody that took the time to watch all the TV shows about this particular person, yep. put, put it all together, summarize it, and then mm -hmm. tell it to the people's, you know, to their audience so that th those people don't have to watch all those shows. Exactly. That's pretty much what I do as well. That's the point. I just, it's so nice to just put it all in one place because it's kind of frustrating to have to go everywhere to even get the facts, you know? <laughs> Uh -huh. to to like wade through all the nonsense and get to the facts I, I would like to also provide that for people at least just like here is everything you don't have to go and watch all of the shows just exactly. so you know how we solved most of our cases in homicide how do you I think if you had to guess how would you say we solved most of them probably interviewing a lot of people 100 percent interview yeah. and interrogation that was 100 yeah. percent and mm -hmm. not just the the, su the suspects or the subjects Yep. but the public and witnesses. Mm -hmm. So I would say 80% of the time it was from interview and interrogation we solved the case. Yeah. And very and not that it's rare rare but uh physical evidence wasn't as didn't solve a case as much as people would think. I mean yeah. you would be like oh my god we got a fingerprint oh hallelujah <laughs> you know or we got a piece of fiber or we got blood evidence so we got DNA. 
Yeah. That doesn't happen as much as people actually think. But when mm-hmm. you do get it, you're like you're pra- you're thanking the gods that uh, yeah. that did that for you. you well, know? also mm-hmm. too, if, if the husband killed her, of course his prints are going to be in the house and his DNA, yeah. all this stuff is because he lives there. Right. <laughs> so yeah. that excludes all type of physical evidence. Duty Ron, you- thank you for the ten dollars super chat. You're the man. <laughs> hey, let me ask you a question. Um, since you've been doing all this research and writing these books on serial killers, yeah. mm-hmm. do you ever come across somebody? Um, could be a fan it just could be somebody that you meet in, in your travels and you mm-hmm. start talking to them uh and you start seeing signs because you could yep. probably tell like you know we were cops for a long time so if i'm talking to somebody for a couple of minutes i already know this guy's a perp yep you know what i'm saying <laughs> do you ever talk to somebody and and in the middle of talking to them you realize man this guy has a this well not this guy but this person has a lot of traits yeah, uh, for somebody who's a psychotic or, or you know a psychopath. Definitely, yeah. It's not yeah, just whether it's social media or in the workplaces I've been in, wherever. Like, yep. <laughs> and what what happens to your your spidey senses tick up? Well, we say spidey senses here because of the Spider Man. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, do your spidey your spidey senses come up? I need a name for mine. Yeah, for me it's just like red flag. <laughs> Literally, well, just a red flag. Okay, those, it's your instincts, and you know, yeah. You, you never disregard your instincts because your instincts mm-hmm. are always right. They are yeah. always right, you know. Mm-hmm. But you know, I think we're training uh, we're training people to uh, to go against their instincts. You know, a lot of times mm-hmm. uh, it's not racism that's that's the, the culprit of it. You know, you could yeah. walk past a, a million people in the street here in New mm-hmm. York City, all different races, ethnicities, whatever, and you, 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 it doesn't bother you at all. But then some people you meet or you see a group coming towards you and the, and you, the hair on the back of your neck goes up. Yep. That's telling you, your body's telling you something's not right about this situation. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're toning down that thing. We're trying, you know, because otherwise you don't want to seem like a racist <laughs> or whatever. But yeah. your body's alerting you. These people are, you know, the energy is not good here. Mm-hmm. We sh- we, yep. we're being trained to shut that down yeah that's not a good thing and i would never shut mine down <laughs> mine is like hyper aware <laughs> it's always there that's kind of also what i'm in therapy for is to like bring that down a little bit but i'm like never <laughs> can never be too careful well yeah. you know it's funny it's like my son went through a breakup recently and he took it really bad he was with this girl for like two years mm-hmm. and he started really like shutting down i said will you go and start working out what the hell's wrong with you and he said oh uh you know you don't always work out uh, he goes oh you work out and you're super hyper too and i said yeah. imagine i didn't mm-hmm, <laughs> I, exactly. you know really crazy and i said that's why you got to work out just to, to release all that that crazy yes exactly you know yep. <laughs> he starts pointing at me i said imagine i didn't work out because i am hyper and i am like you know yeah. i'm type a i recognize all of that you know mm-hmm. how many guys you know how many guys out there on catching a beat and because uh bill is doing spin class twice a yeah, day yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> mark it's time for your commercial well listen up guys and gals we are sponsored by the best so- uh, hot sauce in the world Silk City hot sauce is made with small batches using pure ingredients. Locally grown peppers are the foundation of every bottle of Silk City hot sauce. They have many flavors from mild to wild, and they have uh, great artwork. Uh, You got to check it out. Uh, If you want to get some of this great hot sauce, you visit SilkCityHotSauce.com. SilkCityHotSauce.com. Put in OTC, OTC for off the cuff, and you'll get a 15% discount. And trust me when I tell you, I wouldn't steer you wrong. I love each and every one of you. It's great stuff. I use it all the time. And I'm so ha- uh, I had to give Bill his bottle, so I don't know how, if he's... I, I actually haven't used it yet. I'm not like a big hot sauce guy. You know what I like all, to put on my steak? I mix it with mayonnaise, um, mustard, and uh, horseradish, and that's the best. No, that's good, but, you know, not all of them are so hot, Bill. I, no? I would I would look at the labels and I guarantee you you'll find something you like there. All right, I'll check it out. I feel like Hillary Clinton carrying it around in my uh, <laughs> in my in my in my bag. Remember she said that when she was running for president. Yeah. Oh, I carry a bottle of hot sauce. You're full of shit, Hillary. She ripped it out. She took yeah. the, bo- the hot sauce out of her oh, bag. Oh yeah, she carried it as a prop. Anyway, here's our next commercial. Carol Waters, realtor in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. A lot of New Yorkers are fleeing down south now because of the taxes up here because of the wokeness because of the democrats in the in the uh, state house and, and mayor of new york city so 
let me get off the politics, get back to the real estate. If you're looking to move down south, Carol Waters sells Myrtle Beach at gmail.com. She's part of the Beach Realty Group. She used to work as a bartender at the Fitzpatrick Hotel in New York City. She's a fine Irish girl right from Ireland. And her husband, Rob Mayen, was an NYPD cop who rolled over to FDNY. So if you're looking to move down to Myrtle Beach, give Carol a call, 914-261-6681. If you're going to get in any trouble, people are starting to call me now. Like I'm a, I, I got this lawyer at my fingertips. If you're going to get in any trouble... Joe Murray's our guy. He's a big backer of police off the cuff. Joe's got his own website, joe at jmurray-law.com. He's a great lawyer, and he was also a police officer, so he knows both sides of the fence here. So give Joe Murray a call. And we're back. All right. <laughs> Angela Ang, thank you so much for that 999 Super Chat. We're, we're getting rich from this show. <laughs> Not, but thank you so much. I really guess, appreciate uh, it. Gisela Kirsten has her own podcast. She's also an author, a true crime uh, author, and uh, on serial killers. Each serial killer gets her their own volume, mm -hmm. <laughs> and she goes, she goes deep, she goes deep in. But definitely not to sensationalize them. I didn't mention that. I should have mentioned that earlier. Like my whole thing is to not sensationalize them. So I don't know if you guys have seen my merch. I'm wearing it now, but you can't see it. But it says no yeah, pull it up again. Pull it up so we can. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh my God. This, is, this is the family show. No, 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 no. <laughs> so this says no, nose, nose picker. picker. Why, why is that? It. Um, he was apparently a chronic nose picker. <laughs> Oh, really? Um, I mean, that's well, what they so say. Stephen so Mitchell my dad. Said that. I don't know. Uh, when we talk about, is he digging over here or is he going full knuckle? My father used to go full knuckle right in front of me. <laughs> in there. And, 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 and my father <laughs> also used to do that. My father was Dominican. And Dominicans yeah. do this thing with Vicks. They love Vicks. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. Vicks Vapor Up? Yep. I don't know yep. why. But every morning, like, I, 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 I just remember him going into the bottle with his freaking index finger, boom, and then he'd stick it up there. And then and, and the other side, I don't know why they needed so much, so much fix, but so much fix, yeah. So, what kind of uh, nose picker was he? I don't know. They're just um, Stephen Michaud, who did that whole Ted Bundy tapes on Netflix, you know, put all that together, was saying he was a chronic nose picker and he doesn't know why everyone thinks. He's so hot. I don't think he's hot at all. I don't think serial killers are hot at all. <laughs> so oh, I have no. a whole merch range for that. <laughs> so you know who I wanted to talk to you about because I saw you were interested in him was Richard Ramirez, who I found that that if I was a cop on that show, I would have wanted to execute him when I caught him. Yeah, He did some of the most despicable, most vile things I've ever heard yeah. any human being do to another. And I was like, I, I, I fell in love with the cops the two detectives that had yeah. that case. Uh, Gil Carrillo was one of them. Mm -hmm. and I can't remember the name of the sergeant, but they were great investigators. And that case became so political too. The politicians were putting out things to yeah, the public. Talking about the footprint. Have, right, the footprint that was a special shoe. After that, he didn't wear that shoe anymore, you know, <laughs> because they put that out to the public. I mean, those exactly. are the things that can kill a case, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, well, how did you feel about the Richard Ramirez case? Well, I just remember he smelled like a goat, and I'm going <laughs> to make merch about that because he is like another icon of this hybristophilia where women like really fall in love with him. You Isn't can't that just sick? look at his That's jawline. So yeah, it's just like they look at his jawline and how he looks and how he is, but like he's a disgusting creature. <laughs> We did disgusting things. When he ra when he raped that young girl, I think she was like about yeah, that as well. twelve years old. He took her into like some filthy, disgusting mm -hmm. warehouse. Yeah, exactly. And they they had an interview with her on the show, mm -hmm. and she is so together today. I mean, I'm sure she yep. still suffers, but she was just saying, "I'm not going to let him destroy my life. Yeah, I'm not going to let him define who I am." Exactly. And I, felt, I felt so horrible for her, but you know, thank thank God she is strong like that. You mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Well, well, you mentioned about the Ted Bundy. I think it was her eighties, right? So that was the kind of sort of the the preppy look back then. What he was sporting, and also yeah. with uh, with Ramirez, also the same time frame, but it just a completely different look. He was tall. He was thin. He had the hair. He kind of it, it just. You know, when you say you're not attracted to him or that he wasn't uh, – because I, I I noticed that too. Like everything that um, 
uh, you know, that they're telling you the word attractive and enhancing. Yeah. But yeah. it also has to do with you're comparing yeah. him to other serial killers. <laughs> on a yeah. serial killer level, he was very handsome. You know, mm -hmm. but on a like you wouldn't expect this guy to be a serial killer. No, and yeah, you and he was, you know, he could he he knew enough to to get into law school. He never got out of there, but he knew enough to get in. So he was smart. Mm -hmm. Yep, but that's still so, <laughs> he's not attractive. Uh, so, so what someone, he did, yeah. Someone's asking you, what did you say before? Hyper was it hypersensitive? You said. I think I said hyper vigilant. Hyper vigilant. Right? Okay. Yeah. 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 I think that's what you said. Charleston yeah. Amy wanted to know what you said. Okay. So yeah. That was what you said. But yeah, I understand the whole thing. I just don't understand how people get so enamored with serial killers that they're like become fans of them. Like, did you see but, what this guy did to people? You know, it's and they like, see, <laughs> they see it and they really like it. I think they see it as like power or strength or something, which it really isn't. Most well, right. all serial killers are cowards, you know? Yes. <laughs> not, yeah, I loved when Richard strength. Ramirez, when he got caught by the crowd, I was hoping they would beat him to death. <laughs> and he they got did. Caught <laughs> well, because they published his, his picture was all over. Yeah. And he tried to go back to California. I think he went to Texas or something. He came mm -hmm. back and they saw him and they chased him <laughs> down. And one guy hit him with a steel pipe and stuff. And the <laughs> police, the police funny. came and saved his life. I wish they didn't. Yep. You yep. know, mm -hmm. exactly. I shouldn't say that being a former law enforcement officer, <laughs> but I feel that. I really feel that. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Charleston Amy says serial killers can be attractive. I don't see the attractiveness. I don't care if uh, who's if if um, Brad Pitt was a serial killer. I wouldn't find him attractive. Well, yeah. I don't find, he, I don't find him he, attractive he, anyway because he, I'm, he's I'm not attractive brand. that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, if, yeah. If I if I had to pick a guy, I could do a lot worse than Brad Pitt. I tell you that. And so <laughs> if I had to pick a cellmate, <laughs> you could do a lot worse than Brad Pitt. I tell you that. <laughs> How about uh, you, ever, you ever see that serial killer that um, that did hits for the mob, Richard Kuklinski? Yeah, that's one of my favorites. That guy is nuts. I mean, when I, I saw him interviewed, and he, he's so matter of fact, he's like. I killed one guy for revenge. He told me he was going to kill me. I didn't like that. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, <laughs> when I was doing the uh, when we used to when they used to come for Intac because I was a um, I was a like a trainer a, a trainer like I was a detective. But at, towards the end of my career, I was uh, doing uh, I was doing in in service training where I would basically tell them about OSHA and and OEO, mm -hmm. and then we'd sneak in something else that they needed, like flying while armed. But the video that we used to play every day when they come in and they'd sit waiting for everybody to gather before we started our lectures uh, was that uh, the HBO uh, t um, thing on the, what was he called? I think he was called the Iceman. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was that one. And I know that thing like the back of my hand. I watched it every day and <laughs> always looking at him. And just like you said, that, uh, that you know, cold face and matter of fact. And I think I think that's maybe one of the because you know the FBI interviews these serial killers all the time, trying to create I don't know a profile on what makes up a serial killer. I would imagine mm -hmm. that's one of the things, just a stone cold, um, you know, distant, not really affected by what they've done. Mm -hmm. Well, it's you like know. a psychopath. They're like yeah. they have yeah. no what the 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 ego, the id, and the super ego. They're missing like yep. the ego, right? Isn't that the ego? Yes, so just conscience? some of them are not cold like that. Some of these ones are just so charismatic and so full of life. Well, they act that way, I guess, you know. So it's very difficult to profile them like that, I would guess. Mm -hmm. We yeah. had a writer on our show named Nancy Rommelman. And yeah. she, she interviewed John Wayne Gacy in prison. Damn. And she said he was <laughs> a very manipulative. Yeah. And that whole sexual thing was going on when she was mm -hmm. there, too. He got off on asking her like sexual questions. Yeah. Sergeant Melinda, thank you so much for the super chat. I'm going to read what you said. I just <laughs> love you all so much. The best of the best. Always a great panel and chat with Bill and Mark. Thank you so much for everything you all do for us. Little Bella says hello. Tell little Bella I said hello back. And so does Mark. Thank you, retired <laughs> Sergeant Melinda. <laughs> Joanna Guerrero says, uh, Joanne, Joan Guerrero, I've always been attracted, 
more attracted to my own my opposite, my opposite I guess. Yeah, well, I don't know. That's uh that can mean a lot of things. I'm trying to think what my <laughs> opposite would be. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um yeah, yeah, that's the funny thing is that uh, most of these people the way they they um are able to attract or, or pull in their prey is because they have mm -hmm. to have some level of uh, communication that's yeah that's good they they can yep. they're charming you know Definitely. it's mm -hmm. not just grabbing people off the street some of them yeah. do that too but a lot of the people have to lure these uh, these people in mm -hmm. you know exactly. I would imagine they that um are you, are you married I'm married yeah yeah okay but before you got married I, uh, how long have you been married for eight years now oh, okay yeah. when did you start yeah. writing these books i started writing them last year <laughs> all right why well, you go quick yep. huh? yeah <laughs> I, I was just gonna say something stupid like i would imagine it's tough pulling you in for like out of a bar like you want to head back to my place that's never gonna happen <laughs> right <laughs> yeah that's after, uh, all this, after all this serial killer work there's no taking you back to uh, my place <laughs> after after you know two drinks and let's get out of here no huh <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on the red flags <laughs> fellas, that I'm reading. Yeah. Fellas, you are out of luck if you think you're taking her out after yeah. you're going on a <laughs> Tinder date, a uh, hinge date, and uh, <laughs> getting somebody like Giselle. And you know, that's the funny thing, too, is that since everybody's involved in these true crimes and stuff like that, you figure that the rate of, of being able to, like, like just hook up on the first night has gone down significantly. I'm not out <laughs> there in the mix anymore. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem to slow down. <laughs> I, it, it still happens, though. I, yeah. I know. It. I, I see it out there. I, you know, I hear it from friends. It still happens, but yeah. you figure, like, how could you, like, how could you do that? Like, how could you just meet somebody? We are who we are. We take chances. Yeah, but you know, Mark, we missed the whole. I'm look. I've been married for 32 years, 33 years, whatever. I can't even remember anymore. But we missed the whole era of internet dating. You know, which is, I, I mean, when you hear people talk about it, it's not that great. You know, it's not a, like everyone said, oh, well, I can't wait to get we, back on an internet date. Yeah, you know? when you say we, I think you mean you because uh, I was, uh, you know, I, I was married for 26 years, but I was claiming married single on my taxes. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, but that whole thing with internet dating, I don't know if you talk to young people now, I don't think it's so easy, even though it's, you know, they don't have to go out to a bar or how, how you know look at even the workplace now they discourage from people going out from the yeah, workplace that's, a, that's right? an interesting thing because if you think about how many you know relationships develop at a workplace the only thing you have to i guess it still happens the only thing it has to be with two people that are on like the ev equal level you can't have a boss anymore mm -hmm. there's no more uh you know uh, getting ahead that way literally they call it getting ahead they should <laughs> should be called giving ahead <laughs> giving ahead to get to head <laughs> giving <laughs> some head to get get ahead there you go <laughs> Stephen Washkel Dr. Stephen Washkel also have serial killers who are just psychotic like the son of Sam yeah I, I think most of them are psychotic I really do <laughs> I mean the guy he talked about before Aaron Key he would tell the girls that he was raping how lucky they were to be able to have sex with him because he was so good looking. He would mm -hmm. say that to them, you know, and how, you know, how ridiculous is that, right? That is bad. You You're get lucky that I'm violently violating you, you know? Mm -hmm. You get people like that. They're not only serial killers. I've experienced that in the airline as well, where they say things like that. <laughs> people on the, so not, not on the pilots, I hope. Yeah, the, the pilots, literally. <laughs> oh, they, they hit on the pilots too? No, I'm saying like the pilots were, a lot of them were very, very inappropriate and like abusive. And they would say, you know, in like assault situations, like you're super lucky to be having this with me. It's like, I'm a captain and I'm like amazing. And so that happens in that industry. So it's not, it's not that fun. How, how ridiculous, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, okay. it's really ridiculous. <laughs> Although when I was a sergeant in the police department, I was an anti-crime. I used to tell my guys to call me the Supreme Commander. <laughs> <laughs> I would go over the air, Supreme Commander to Central K, and they'd be like, Sarge, you can't say that. 
He, he, he still makes me call him that off the air. Yeah, right. Supreme when I call him, I go, hey, Bill, is this the Supreme Commander? Yes. <laughs> Joan funny. Guerrero says, I was USMC. Oorah. Some Marines were very full of themselves. Well, that's that mm -hmm. whole macho thing. They, yeah. they claim cops are like that, too. People always would be like, oh, cops got to be so macho. That's not always <laughs> true. You well, know? there's yeah. a certain amount. There's a certain amount of ego that's, uh, you know, has to. It's involved with trying to get ahead. This the country's America is founded on that. Mm -hmm. You want to succeed, you have to kind of. It's competitive here, and you mm -hmm. have to kind of sort of, at least in your head, believe that you're better than the next person. And that's where mm -hmm. it all yeah. stands. <laughs> and then when it comes to trying to to meet a companion, um, you're going to uh, pull out all the stops and tell them how great you are. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, it's it's just the, the the question is, what you know, what are the, you have to be able like you like I mentioned earlier, you have to be able to see through. Is somebody just bragging because they're nervous on the first date, or are they really like, is something yeah. wrong with them? You know what I'm saying? Are they really like they don't shut up about themselves? <laughs> that could, you know, like they haven't asked you a question about yourself all night. They just keep mm -hmm. talking. You know what I'm saying? Yep, self belief versus narcissism. I guess <laughs> it's a fine line there. You know, you have to have self belief, but to be totally narcissistic, that's a special <laughs> kind of person. Mm -hmm. Is your husband a writer too? No, he's well, he's a coder, so I guess it's a type of writing. <laughs> well, uh, like a computer coder? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. That's an interesting psychological uh, background. A crime yep. writer and a computer coder. There's mm -hmm. got to be a serial killer there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So luckily, we are not serial killers. But um, no, I, we, we just, making, um, yeah, we make. I told you we were going to pick on you and, and hit you with some jokes yep. here and there. You know, we make an interesting you know, duo. <clears throat> you know what's funny is that whenever you, like, <laughs> it's always the person that nobody ever suspected that's a serial mm -hmm. killer. Like, oh, I lived yeah. next door to him for so many years. Yeah, you know it's it's unfortunate because I work with a bunch of people on a daily basis where I I, f I feel like they have the potential to be ki like crazy killers. Yeah, and like, and I just want to report them somewhere. But <laughs> Mark, I put I put Sergeant Melinda on the screen since she's been so good to us. You see that? I just yeah. figured out how to do that. I can memorialize. I can even put Joe Murray up there. Look at that! Look <laughs> at that! The women, guy, the huh? women love Joe Murray, and and and, and Angie's <laughs> getting pissed. When he goes on podcast and they're like, oh, he's so handsome. So <laughs> girls, don't say Joe and Murray's so handsome. Just hire him as your attorney. <laughs> <laughs> His girlfriend gets she gets jealous. <laughs> yeah, listen. <laughs> so uh where are we right now? We're almost at the end here. Is there anything that you want to plug it, it, that you are you're working on right now? You want to get out there? Well, let's plug the website for uh, the podcast, first of all. What's the the podcast is what's the name yeah of the, podcast? the podcast is um, Grizzly Books, and the website is also grizzly bookscom So all the links to the podcast, the books, and everything is on the website. So that would probably be the easiest place to go. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I noticed is that uh, you you mentioned that you're self um, self published yeah. self published. Yeah. So tell can you take us a little bit real quick about what that what that process is like. For the, anybody out there, uh, we have a lot of law enforcement that have books in them and they, they, they don't know about that. Okay. So places like Amazon and Smashwords make it fairly easy. It's definitely not an easy thing, but you can self-publish these days. But you would need – my husband actually designs all my covers and he's designed the website. So it's handy to have that around because <laughs> that's the most difficult part. You can write the manuscript, but then to format it and have the cover and everything done, you, you're going to need help, you know. So you could go to Fiverr and hire people if someone's looking for a cover creator. That would be a great place to go. Luckily, we do everything in-house. We want, like, no overheads, you know, because mm -hmm. a writer's life is not a very wealthy life. <laughs> you want, like, no overheads and just keep on making books. So, write so you have you, you have a book uh, complete that I've, like, let's say I, I wrote a book. Now yeah. I'm like, do I, I go to Amazon? Is that what I do? Yeah, it's um, it's called KDP, which is their publishing platform. That's for Amazon, and you go on there and make a KDP account, and you can upload your manuscript, upload the cover that you bought from someone or someone's made, and then you click publish. It's honestly the best <laughs> feeling ever to click publish. Like yes, there's yeah, I would product. imagine they would send you a couple of copies so you have for yourself. But uh, for the from that point on, 
once you start yeah. promoting it, people can buy the book yeah. and, and they'll send them out, right? Uh, yeah, they do. Yeah, they'll send them out. And actually, I have to buy my own copies too. <laughs> they don't just send me copies. I wish they would. <laughs> uh -huh. But you can order author copies, but it's 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 slightly discounted, but hardly. Honestly, I have to. to that's why I'm very possessive over these. <laughs> Hold uh -huh. on to these few I've got here. I'm like, these are mine. <laughs> your husband does very nice covers, by the way. Before you even mentioned that your husband does the covers, I, I you know, he put up the grid. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Just yeah, or someone, someone wants to hear you say. How dare you? I don't know why. Go ahead, do it. How dare you? Yeah. <laughs> is that a South African thing? I don't know. Right? Yeah. Is it? I, I don't, don't know. know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You know what? Says, we should say, how dare you? Since, since he had the guts to ask for it, we should probably ask for one more. Um, but we'll do it on three. So this way he has it. Uh, Juan <laughs> Valdez has it, you know, whatever he's going to do with it. So. One, yeah, two, at seven fifty-five, she's gonna say, "How dare you?" Go ahead, you just should I say it again? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, one more. How dare you? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Our fans love that, you know, especially when we do yeah. like things like that. I think I like Joe Murray. Joe Murray, that's exciting. I've been thinking about writing a book. Awesome. Joe Murray has an interesting story to tell. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's a, that's a. I would I would watch that movie. Uh, yeah. That's a that's a pretty good uh, that's a pretty Retired good. Retired Sergeant Melinda, thank you for you you plugging our Patreon is awesome to be a part of Police Off the Cuff. Thank you so much, guys. Just so you know, we're putting out a website. It should be up in the next week or two. Uh, we're doing a lot of exciting things tomorrow night. Mark and I are doing a comedy show at someone's house. That's the first. I'm a little bit terrified. no, no. It's not at a house. <laughs> it's at a. It's at a. a, a I think it's a, a type of catering hall. Maybe oh, a, so, all right. I haven't got. It's I a retired. I haven't been up in like six months. A so, retired member of the service. Yeah, I got to I got to bone up on my material in like about eight hours. So <laughs> I'm gonna be a little nervous, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do it anyway. I mean, it's don't be nervous. Be you just have to do thirty minutes. It's not a lot. In thirty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna talk about this show then. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna bring up Gisela and talk about her all night. Uh, as soon as you, as soon as you go up, I'm I'm gonna take a ride somewhere and come back in twenty minutes. <laughs> be like, where's Mark? He's got a half hour. He's got 45 minutes. There's no bailing out early tomorrow. Oh, God. That's <laughs> Patreon is awesome to be part of uh, Police Off the Go. Thank you, uh, retired Sergeant Melinda. That's great. The right <laughs> shoe. Yes, how dare you? Yes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Giselle, you got to promise us, though, when you got another book coming out, you contact me and, and come back on the show, and we'll talk about your book. That would be awesome. Yeah, I feel like we didn't even really scratch the surface of who you are because an hour, it yeah. goes by so quickly, you know. But, it really uh, does. <laughs> it's unbelievable, right, how fast yeah. it does. But, uh, yeah. you know, so you, you'll definitely come back on. And I know right now it's probably 2 o'clock in the morning in the Netherlands, right? It is. <laughs> so you got to have like a shot of scotch and go right to bed, right? Probably because you know I've had coffee. So <laughs> <now I'm waiting. laughs> you know, 2 yep. o'clock in the morning, you know what, what that means in New York, right? It's well, serial killer time. Sleep. Yeah, it is. It goes to sleep and then it's serial killer time. Yeah, because yeah, I was there yeah. in New York a few times and New York is asleep uh -huh. at two or three. <laughs> you know why they call it broad daylight? Because it's light out. No crime should happen. <laughs> it yeah. happened in broad daylight. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it shouldn't happen. You mm -hmm. get, you, if something happens to you at two o'clock in the morning, unless you were coming home from work, you should yeah. have been out. Go home. Behave yourself. Yeah, yeah. like you should yeah. expect to get shot or mugged no, or if it's one o'clock in the morning. You should just expect. No, it. Don't say I'm just saying that's the way the press I know. is. I know. I'm yeah. Kidding. Oh, well, whatever happens after midnight, hey, you shouldn't be yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should be home. You know. Yeah. Anywho, we had a wonderful time with you. Um, and Laura, Laura Daly said, "Gisela, thank you for the great stream." So you, got you, some, you got some me, fans. Yeah. You got some fans on here. How dare you have fans on our show? Yeah, how dare it? I know they also <laughs> like when I say "damn." If I say <laughs> "damn," they like that as well on the podcast. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, damn. They was like, "Can you say that again?" Damn. Oh, I love that. That's I mean, great. So you got yeah. some expressions that your fans love. You know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes I have people tell me that uh, they, you know, oh wow, I like your accent. I always think they're messing with me. <laughs> like what do you call I always want to like you call me stupid. <laughs> Listen on the screen I have Angela Eng. That's Joe Murray's girlfriend, and she's a third degree black belt in karate. So if you think he's <laughs> handsome, that's okay, but don't go any further than that. You're kicking okay. your ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know who's gonna kill me now? Uh, well, you know, I did this uh this show uh FBI's most wanted. The lead guy yep. of the show 
I think mm-hmm. he's from South Africa. He's also he he played um in the Marvel Comics movie. Um Damn it. Uh, <laughs> <he's a character. laughs> it was a wizard type of character, but he played that guy. He was okay. South African. Yeah. And he, uh, on the break, you know, uh, when we're recording, he has to speak American English. And on the break, okay. he goes back into his South African <laughs> accent. That's and so funny. He, him and a couple of other people there, they're like, oh, we really like your uh, your New York <laughs> accent. I was like, it's not an accent. This is all I got. <laughs> yeah. When we start taping again, you're going to hear the same thing. It's me. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Angie corrected me. She's a third degree, degree black oh, belt in yeah. jujitsu. Not karate. Mm-hmm. Jiu-jitsu, you will get the so, rear naked right, chokehold if you right, mess so with she'll that. Right, so she'll just hold you there till the police yeah. show up. <laughs> you don't want to be rear naked chokehold by the end. That's right. Nothing <laughs> naked there when you're talking about Joe Murray. <laughs> <laughs> and Gisela, she, uh, this is from retired Sergeant Melinda. You're a beautiful soul, and we have such respect for you. Thank you. Uh, How is thank that, you so Gisella? much. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. The, thank that, you. That, that's the parting words. And you are a beautiful soul, Gisela, and thank you. <laughs> To think I met you like two months ago on LinkedIn, and here you are, yep. thousands of miles yep. away, but you're in your own house, and you yes. got to be on our show, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It was such an honor. If thank you ever you visit so New York with your husband, let me know. I'll put, uh, you know, we'll get you into a comedy show. We'll have a great night. It'll be a lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you so much. All you police off the cuff fans, thank you so much for watching. As always. From Bill Cannon and Mark DeMeo. Mark, you have any final? Yeah, final I just want to say if you're uh, I'm a Saturday night, I'm at the Eastville in uh, downtown Brooklyn. Uh, showtime, 8, 30, 8 o'clock and 9.30. If you're in anywhere near Brooklyn and you want to come and hang out, have a couple of drinks and some laughs, uh, the Eastville Comedy Club. It's eastvillecomedyclub.com. That's it? That's it. And I, this weekend, I'm nowhere, so you don't have to come see me. <laughs> well, tomorrow I'm night home. we're at... Uh, I'm home drinking Cabernet. Right? Sean Linsky's uh, retirement party. <laughs> All right. That, that's right. That's right. So, well, folks, good night to everyone. Gisela, again, thank you so much. You were a real pleasure to have on the show. Everyone, thank you. good night now. <laughs>